Uh, she's the Craig Weaver Professor of Pediatrics, Professor of Health Policy, and Professor of Law at Vanderbilt University. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and serves as a co-chair of the report review of the National Academies. Her research uses empirical normative and legal analytic methods to study ethical, legal, and social issues arising from advances in gen genetics and genomics. She's co-PI of Get Precise, which is Vanderbilt University Medical Center's transdisciplinary center of excellence on gen genomic privacy and identity. And so she'll be speaking today um, for, uh, in our um, IGB Pioneer Lecture. Um, and um, so what we'll do is we'll have the microphones off during the lecture itself, but please uh, feel free to put things on the chat if you have, if you have questions as we go along. And at the end, uh, we'll, we'll have a little uh, time for uh, questions with, um, where we can use the microphones uh, and, and, and talk. So, okay, well, uh, let me uh, turn it over to you now, Professor Clayton. Thanks for joining us. Well, I have to say thank you for inviting me. It has been a real pleasure talking with some of your members earlier today and realizing what an incredibly exciting setup you have going on here. So, and I'm hopeful at some point in the future, I'll get a chance to come back in person, but, um, in any event, but I'm delighted to talk with you now about some of the work that I've been doing. Whoops. Uh, I actually don't have any financial disclosures, but I will say that I have recently been inviting the, advising the Joint Pathology Center on how to govern their image repository. I spend a lot of time thinking about how we ought to uh, govern and protect data. And this is a repository of 55 million slides dating back before um, the 1918 flu. So it's raised some really cool and interesting question, so I thought I would mention that. Um, the outline of my talk is that genetic privacy is a complex and poorly understood group of concepts. Um, and although there are many gaps in healthcare and biomedical research and its regulation, to date, the evidence of discrimination and non-dignitary harms is limited, but it has been the primary focus of what um, investigators in my field have been thinking about for a long time. The scope of concerns, however, has expanded in a way that frankly, to me, is almost a game changer. And I'm gonna share some of my current thoughts about that with you. My husband is an English professor and he's getting ready to teach in just a minute. So he's printing his notes behind me. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of hype out there about is genetic privacy a myth? Um, welcome to the future where everybody knows your genetic code. Um, and we've also spent a lot of time over many years um, doing empirical genetic privacy studies. Um, we did a systematic review um, now four years ago um, of studies, 53 studies that involved almost 50,000 participants. And we at looked at what it was that the investigators were interested in. And so I would just point out that the ones in blue are medical information, identification, very few about re-identification, confidentiality. Um, the ones in red are about governance and uh, uh, personal control. Oh, you, you, uh -oh. Um, but the most of them have been uh, concerns about misuse of data um, and um, they worry about me. local researchers. Just a second. Uh, pr Professor Clayton, I think that we can't see your slides. We saw them in the test, but we can't see them now. I'm sorry. No. Um, okay. Let's try it. That better? There we go, yes. When you referred better. to the blue, I knew we were missing something. Okay. But we were following to... along. Okay. <laughs> the point that I wanna make here is that the overwhelming majority of studies until relatively recently focused on discrimination. They didn't care anything about any of the other aspects of privacy. And they mostly were worried about um, discrimination by employers and to some extent by insurers, um, a little bit by the government. And a, little, and a few of them asked about trade-offs because after all, um, um, after all, usually to protect privacy, it comes at some cost. So the point that I wanna make here is that the focus for 
a decade at least has been on discrimination, um, which I think is which is important uh, to think about. Um, so, and there's been a tremendous debate about research that I'm just going to allude to. I'd be happy to take questions about this because I've thought about this for a really long time. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether biospecimens in DNA are identifiable per se, about whether we have to have informed consent for any use of this. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, there's been tremendous pressure for broad consent for data sharing, which frankly overwhelms the idea of just about any kind of individual control. Um, and also, once the final rule got uh, amended in, in 19, I mean, in 2017, the common rule has many exceptions uh, regarding data use in, for which informed consent is not required, not only information from which, uh, data from which identifying information has been removed, but even some data uh, that contains personal, personally identifiable health information. Um, HIPAA has few, few but it still um, has some. Well, it has, its definition of de-identification is very tight, but it has 12 public pu purpose exemptions, which make a whole lot of data available. Neither one of these provide much oversight of research or use. Um, and despite this sort of uh, roiling debate about how, how much control people ought to have about the use of data about them for research, um, and the fact is that m many people, and in many cases, most people are willing to participate at least hypothetically and donate data for these purposes. So I can come back to this in the question and answer period, but I think this is an area that's been well tried. Um, how much governance there is of biobanks depends on where they are. Um, academic medical centers, um, are subject to HIPAA, the common rule, contract, data sharing requirements, privately funded um, are subject to the common rule. If federal funds are involved, um, contract is variable. Um, and then of course the government in dbGaP is subject just to the common rule. So the picture that I want you to see is that the way we actually govern research use of data is actually full of holes and exceptions um, and people not knowing that it's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, this, I guess this is old news, but I just want to say it. At the same time that we have been asking all these questions about genetic discrimination, the fact of the matter is there's almost no evidence of it. Um, uh, if you look at employers, there's almost no evidence that it's been used for that purpose. And the issue with insurance, which is quite interesting, is that everybody goes, oh, Gina, that'll take care of it. Well, Gina oh, won't take care of much. And if you want to talk about the laws that actually do make a difference, uh, they are to some extent the Americans with Disabilities Act. But most importantly is the Affordable Care Act with its elimination of the pre-existing condition um, uh, uh, exclusion. So people worry a lot about it. There's just not a lot of evidence. So, so what we've done at Vanderbilt is a confluence of projects, um, of which precise, get precise is right at the top of this. Um, you can see this, this is us. But the fact of the matter is we have many other projects that are going on at Vanderbilt, um, all of which turn on these issues about what we're doing with data. Um, uh, Vanderbilt is the data repository for all of us. Uh, the million, uh, the million uh, person project to collect DNA and other data. Um, we are doing a project called PRISM, looking at thinking about uh, the intersections of genetics and uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, I recently completed a project uh, with Susan Wolf and a host of others, um, looking at defining, uh, defining um, the law related to uh, genomics, and we just finished a paper, not just a few years ago, finished a paper on genetic privacy, which appeared in the Journal of Law and the Biosciences. Um, RIS Emerge is one of the large data uh, projects. Right now, its goal is to talk about 
uh, developing uh, uh, genomic risk scores, polygenic risk scores, and returning them to patients, which is a pretty interesting thing to do. Um, we've also been a major site for thinking about how to work with underrepresented groups who uh, continue to be reluctant to participate in this research. Um, all of this in the context of a very aggressive uh, push toward genomic medicine at Vanderbilt. And so it makes uh, genetic privacy right at the center of our, um, of our work. But the concept of genetic privacy means different things to different people. Um, at one point, it's the right to be let alone. You know, the idea that you can move throughout the world and not have people know exactly, um, you know, what you're doing or who you are. You know, obviously, this is part of a much larger uh, debate that's going on currently in society. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Shoshana Zuboff's uh, uh, surveillance capitalism, um, all, the, all the tracking that's going on with us, thinking about whether we have a right to be let alone or not. Um, how much control and oversight is there of how data are used? I've made the point that people individually don't have much control. Um, um, and the issues of oversight, I think, are really quite complicated and ones that where we need to devote a tremendous amount of attention, um, but ones that we don't have robust uh, systems yet, and protection from um, use and misuse. So this is, um, this is our, these are our, uh, uh, aims for our current version of Get Precise. And, um, and I know you can't read this, but I'm going to just make a point here that I, I think maybe will help you. We are, we are really broadening the scope of how we look and how we think about um, genetics and what the public thinks about it and where they get their information. Um, and this includes not only TV and film, direct-to-consumer genetic testing, um, et cetera. We also are looking at issues, obviously, of the legal and regulatory frameworks, um, which suddenly are becoming a major course of um, a major source of activity um, that we're looking at. And then, of course, uh, we're doing a lot of work thinking about developing new technologies and frameworks to try to figure out how to protect genetic privacy and identity without um, giving too much information context in a way that would make it too difficult to do research. So how do people learn about genetics? Well, they may go, they may listen to the news. I mean, who knows which news, but they may listen to the news. They may go online. Um, uh, certainly the story of the immortal life of Henrietta Locks has had a tremendous impact um, about how people think about genetics, even though I think the way that story was uh, told in part um, uh, raises some very interesting questions. This, uh, that case occurred in 1951, which was well before the common rule um, in the United States, but, uh, uh, but nonetheless has really had an enormous impact, certainly influenced Francis Collins and others at the NIH. But we hypothes hypothesized in our study that TV and film are important. So um, my husband, the English professor, um, is leading our group looking at uh, TV and film. He's also written about uh, genetics and literature for quite some time, but this is looking at um, films and television episodes um, from 1912 to 2020 um, uh, that were coded for more than 109 attributes. And what I want you to see here is attitudes about uh, genetics in film. That's it. Um, that's the figure on my left that has the uh, has the bigger red part, and the um, and the and the attitudes toward genetics and television, and the point is this: that in film, almost three quarters of the film present genetics as being primarily risky, and the 22 percent that's mixed actually tends to have a good guy and a bad guy, you know a good guy geneticist and a bad guy geneticist, and they're facing it off and whoever wins, wins. And so the idea that genetics is an unmitigated good is true only in about 5% of these films, 231 of them. Um, by contrast, the, t the story is somewhat more mixed in television, but the story is still complicated um, in the sense that almost half think of TV as being risky. Um, and, an, um, and more than a third 
view it as mixed again with good cops and bad cops. So this is really, you know, this is what the public sees. Um, they may also read books and do other things, but this is an important source of information. Um, there are four uh, uh, stories of the I Am Legend series uh, beginning in 1954 and the last one in uh, 2007 featuring Will Smith. Uh, my uh, uh, my uh, clip isn't working, but I'll just tell, I'll remind you for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, that this, this film opens with an interview with Emma Thompson, just about my favorite actress, um, being interviewed because she has found a cure for cancer. And the interviewer says, how many people have you, uh, you know, have you treated? And like a thousand, how many of them have cured? All of them. Well, it turns out that this was a bad plan. And so the whole rest of the story is about how whatever this cure was got out of, um, got out of control. And ultimately, Will Smith sacrifices himself to develop a cure that will uh, get rid of this um, evil genetic engineering. So just that gives you some idea about what we're talking about. This is the thing I was afraid I'm going to. Okay, another uh, film that people have been um, talking a lot, or a series that people have been talking a lot about is Orphan Black, one of the coolest, uh, one of the coolest TV shows of the last five years for sure, um, where the same person plays a clone. Um, and it turns out there are lots and lots of clones. Um, but this story, among other things, raises the question about some of the clones are gay, some of them aren't. Um, how is this, how does this played out? Um, and I would say that Jay's group, uh, my husband, has published 19 articles about um, the way uh, genetics is portrayed in uh, TV and film. So, you know, a really growing body of inf information that we may, may want to pay attention to because it's so prevalent. And particularly in the last year when most of us have watched TV every single night, really pre prevalent. So the findings were uh, that there was a uh, that there was an informational turn that the breaches affected families and communities, not just individuals. Um, there were intersectional natures of harms, and especially vulnerable uh, communities. Um, and there were unethical unethical research and unintended consequences um, were two of the most common uh, concerns. And methodologically, the affective dimension was really um, important. This group has now started a project looking at genetics and surveillance, um, which will think, you know, for those of you who think about this, was clearly brought to the fore in Gattaca. Um, I remember being on NHGRI's council when Gattaca came out. Um, let me say that it was not well received by the leadership. Um, but if you may recall, Ethan Hawke's hair was, uh, was scooped up in order to find out whether it was him or um, uh, or Jude Law who was actually doing the job, he was he had stolen Jude Law's uh, genetic identity. So more about surveillance. I think this is going to be an enormously important issue going forward as we think more and more about surveillance, not by the government necessarily, but by you know by big by big companies um, and and other entities of that nature by the Googles and so. Um, this, I think this is going to be a big issue thinking about privacy and identity. Can you be let alone in a society that monitors everything that you do? So um, another question that we have to ask is where are genomic data? And, and in the red box is the way we used to think about it. Um, we used to think about it as being in research biobanks a little bit in electronic medical records, really not so much because we actually didn't, um, uh, uh, because there wasn't much genomic data in electronic medical records. Um, that's changing. I mean, we, you know, we do this all the time um, at Vanderbilt, and I think just about every major institution does. But the point to be made here is that that's not where the data are that we have to be worried about. I mean. 
they're sort of protected. I mean, they're sort of protected by HIPAA, sort of protected by the common rule. I mean, there's something there, but there are all kinds of other places where genetic data are, and we need to be thinking about them. Um, one is compelled authorization. Another is voluntary sharing, which I'll say a little bit more about, and quite a bit about direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Um, so um, Mark Rothstein reported a few years ago that 25 million Americans each year are compelled to sign authorizations directing their healthcare providers to disclose their health records to a third party, either for employment or application for individual insurance, um, whether health insurance or life insurance, many others. So the idea that you know we have a complete choice to keep this to ourselves is really not true. And once it's disclosed to a non-covered entity, um, HIPAA protections do not apply. So a lot of compelled information out there, it's in the context of the electronic health record, but remember that that record increasingly um, includes a lot of genomic information. Um, another thing to say is that, the, uh, I said this earlier, but I'll reiterate it, the pressure toward broad sharing of, of genomic data is enormous. I cannot get a grant to do genomics research unless I get informed consent from um, individuals, from the patients who provide data to me to share their data uh, for any purpose under the sun, uh, depending whether, you know, without their knowledge what it is and what, uh, even what my knowledge is. Now, the argument by NIH is this, that they pay for these data and in order to maximize the value of these data, they need to be combined with other data. And that, uh, and th I mean, that's the argument that we really need to get maximum value out of that research. But the idea that people actually have a choice about what happens with data about them is really pretty illusory, all things considered. Um, and you don't have to, and it, I got these quotes just in the last couple of years, but the fact is there's a drumbeat about this every day. So, so research data are becoming really increasingly um, available. And the other thing we see is that people are sharing data and they're sharing data about themselves. Um, and there are lots of these. Um, you can come, um, free the data is one, um, opensnip.org. And of course, remember, that it's not so much that it's your DNA that's in there or your sequence that's in there. I mean, that's important. Um, but the other thing that's in there to be useful for research, almost always, you have to have some phenotypic data in there. You have to have something about the characteristic of the individual. And, and frankly, um, at the end of the day, I am less concerned about what happens with my genome that I am concerned about my electronic health record or other information about me. I just think that's closer to who I am as a person and it, and it, is, it has more utility. In addition, there are patient support, support groups, social media, so a lot of data sharing that's going on um, in a way that's important. So, and of course the big kahuna, um, Ancestry, um, Ancestry.com, uh, uh, 23andMe. Now, I want to be clear here, the direct-to-consumer industry is enormous, and it has many things other than what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, uh, my colleague, James Hazel, published a paper a few years ago looking at privacy policies of all kinds of direct-to-consumer genetic testing, um, and included not only uh, uh, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, which tend to be the real uh, leaders in this field. But there are numerous other um, uh, companies, so some of those that do nutrigenomics, um, a tremendous number that look for infidelity um, with attractive names like SheCheats.com. And so, uh, you know, so these are all out there in ways that and I'm going to come back to what I think the implications of some of those are, but I want to focus right now on um, on uh, direct to consumer ancestry health uh, sites um, as of last year. Why do people do this? 
Um, people want to find their relatives. Um, the connections are sometimes mediated through the companies themselves, um, which sometimes offer people choice about whom to contact. But increasingly, people post their identified DNA information on websites. They do this in part because if you're an Ancestry uh, user, then you won't know people who are in 23.com. But if the people in 23.com post their data in GEDmatch, for example, and you post your data in, 20, in GEDmatch, then all of a sudden it's possible to uh, connect with each other. Um, so that's what people usually do this for. It's interesting that the health business is not, uh, is not nearly, as, uh, nearly as common. Ancestry said they were gonna get into it and then got out of it. That was because they didn't think it was worth the effort. Um, and I'll give you some more information about what people uh, think about this. Whoops. So, so I wanna talk about two uses of um, these posted um, data. Um, one of them is the case of forensics. And I think we all heard about the identification of the alleged Golden State Killer, um, which was done um, when C.C. Moore's company um, uh, used, when law enforcement actually entered a, um, entered a sample um, from one of the cases, um, one of the cases that this guy killed under a different name into GED match, and they found uh, and they found, um, they found him. They actually found somebody else first, but they, they found him. And so these, uh, these big databases, uh, the uh, GED match and others are much more powerful than for typical forensic databases. Typical forensic databases held by law enforcement under CODIS um, um, are taken from people who either have been arrested or convicted of a, variety, of a variety of crimes. They have a very limited amount of data in them. Uh, they are not kept with their identifiers. Um, the actual identifications are held at the local sites. Um, and they are, uh, they, they are big, not actually not as big as um, Ancestry and 23andMe, um, but they also are breathtakingly biased because we know who gets, who gets arrested and who gets convicted. And so, you know, very heavily biased toward underrepresented minorities. So they had used, FBI had used um, CODIS on numerous occasions to try to find the, uh, um, the alleged Golden State Killer. Well, why didn't they find him? One is because he's white and two, because he's a cop. Um, and so, but looking at these big databases, um, they could identify, they found a fourth, uh, fourth degree cousin and managed to track him down. Now this is not trivial work, but it is, but it's a whole new way of uh, looking for, uh, looking for criminals. Uh, so, and I just want to make a couple of observations about this. Um, one of them is that I actually have not um, put uh, my DNA sequence um, on GED match or any other uh, personal thing, but there is nothing I can do to prevent my relatives from pu publishing their DNA sequences, um, despite its impact on me. So, um, Yanni Verlik at a meeting last week suggested that um, perhaps the, the majority of people of Northern European um, ancestry can be identified um, using a GED match. Um, his claims are actually sort of outsized, but nonetheless, that's what he claims. But the fact of the matter is I have no ability to prevent my sisters or my cousins or my aunts or my, I mean, none of those people. I can't control any of that. Um, and the ability of the websites to control access once identified data are posted may be limited. Now, GED Match revised its policy to say that people had to be able to opt in to, being, to um, allow use for law enforcement. Um, interestingly, this company was since acquired by a company that does forensic genealogy, so I'm not sure how well that's gonna work. Um, Family Tree DNA, interestingly enough, uh, actually seeks to promote such uses as a tool to say, don't you wanna help find killers? So that's why they wanna do this. 
And I think more importantly, courts are already saying, we don't care whether your people want to have their you have data about them used to find criminals. We're going to issue a warrant and you're going to have to turn it over. And so such warrants have actually been served on Ancestry, Ancestry.com, which has well over 20 million samples. Now, whether they comply or not is a different issue. Um, whether this is, um, you know, whether this is a good policy or not, I think is an open question. Um, we actually pu uh, published a provocative article a couple of years ago in which we suggested that what we ought to have is a universal identification database for law enforcement that's under their control because they do control it um, and then tell them to keep hands off Ancestry.com and 23andMe. Now, obviously, they're not going to pay attention to what we had to say, but, but there are some real trade-offs here to be made. So... Um, uh, and so you may end up with contact you don't want from law enforcement. Um, and so, I mean, so one bit of good news is that making the use of uh, directed consumer test results available for law enforcement may be more just uh, given the bias. Another thing that might be a, a, an advantage of having just a universal uh, database would be if it applied to congressmen and their congresswomen and their children maybe they would pay more attention to um, protecting it. But nonetheless, that's not gonna happen. And we've already had cases where people have complained that they were tricked into giving up their DNA, which were then used by law enforcement uh, to, uh, to find one of their children as a criminal. Something that some people in our own focus groups um, think is a good idea. Other people in focus groups say, no, I really want to be able to protect my tribe. Um, in, the, in the focus groups that we mentioned, we asked people what their view about the likelihood of using an at-home test, a direct-to-consumer test was. And the one that sticks out is this one. Can you see my arrow? Oh, good. Um, so you'll see that making information available for law enforcement was the most powerful reason why people didn't uh, wouldn't share their data. So, I mean, people were generally quite, in th these were people who were thinking about doing direct-to-consumer genetic testing, but hadn't done it yet. And as we, we followed them as they went along to see, you know, what they thought about getting these tests themselves, ultimately, they generally seemed to think it was a good idea, but the law enforcement issue was a big deal. So, um, so the other thing that has gotten less attention, but I think is really, really important, and that I am hoping to find some time to do sometime soon, is thinking about the way these tests disrupt family relationships. And they are enormous. Um, uh, sometimes people really like these results. Uh, the, it, it, I, I, I almost view this as uh, DTC porn, but, um, um, but you can look and see some people are really delighted to find that they have other relatives. Um, some people are really delighted to find these relatives and it, you make some kinds of connections with them, go visit them, do a variety of uh, things of that nature. But sometimes the results are not well received. Um, and boy, it is not hard to find this. Um, that uh, uh, Ricky Lewis, who uh, writes a lot in the Genetic Literacy Project, um, revealed that uh, she had a DNA test and she found out that her half-sister actually wasn't her half-sister. Um, and so uh, this happens quite a bit. Um, I think that the impact of these tests on family relationships are going to be have the potential to be really profound, really disruptive. We're already seeing it in, um, we're already seeing it in uh, some of the cases where uh, somebody who has been a, a social father to a child for actually a number of years, even into, um, even into early teenage years, um, finds out that in fact the child is not biologically his and walks away and says, I don't have to pay child support because I'm not dad. So this idea, uh, this idea about, you talk about genetic essentialism, this is where it's really coming out in ways that I think have 
tremendous potential to be really quite, um, quite disruptive. And so um, I think we'll see how this goes out on after time, but it just is a subject that I'm really quite interested in. The other thing we did, um, and this is Zijun, uh, 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 Zijun Yin, who's um, one of our faculty in, um, in our center, um, he actually looked at almost more than 150,000 Reddit posts um, about Ancestry.com and 23andMe. And I want to make an important point here that, uh, and I'm sorry that this looks a little blurry, at least on my screen and probably on yours, that the thing that elicited the most responses, both positive and negative, were the issues of kinship. Some of them thought it was great. Some of them thought it was terrible. But the fact of the matter is the, the biggest amount was on that. Um, issues about health risks, uh, they had some impact, but not as much as kinship. Um, and then other things that they, uh, that they, were, that they commented on were sort of uh, testing processes and, and genealogy. But the point is that this is where the disruption is going to be. This is where the harms are going to come. Um, and I have to say that I had about a month, uh, not a month ago, about a year or two ago, I was sitting in my office and I looked at my voicemail because I don't like answering the phone. And um, and there was, a, there was a man saying, um, my mother wants to talk to you because she says, uh, she's your mother's sister. And I went, this is not happening. I mean, my mother passed away many years ago, and I thought, I just do not need this. So, um, so I think this is going to, this is going to be disruptive in a way um, uh, that we'll have, we will see the consequences of. Um, I also want to say that there are obviously new data privacy laws being passed in response um, uh, to, uh, you know, to many issues in this area. Um, obviously, the, the the CCPA is the one that we spent the most time thinking about. Has lots and lots of holes. Um, they actually tried to pass a law that uh, 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 tried to govern direct to consumer testing, um, which was vetoed by the governor. Um, last year, but is probably going to come back. Actually, um, uh, Gavin Newsom actually sort of invited them to fix it in a variety of ways, and then he'd sign it. So that's um, that's probably the case. Uh, Virginia passed a new law uh, last month. Um, I can see that I don't type well, um, and that uh, there's a new law pending in Florida and in many other states. Um, one of the things that's going to be a major issue is that these laws all differ. And so it's going to have a tremendous impact on interstate commerce um, as people try to comply with these, or maybe not, because maybe what's going to happen is that the big companies are simply going to pay attention to the um, European uh, 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 General Data, uh, Data Protection Regulation and just hope that it takes care of everything. And several bills are pending in Congress as well. But I want to note. This is something that um, is just from last week, that there are a number of states that have, um, three states have already passed laws, um, have already had laws signed, um, others are in committee, um, and we, I think we will certainly see, at least in some parts of the country, that there will be uh, genetic privacy laws um, or data privacy laws that are going to be uh, that are going to be um, conflicting, and I think we're going to create a fair amount of mess for what we're going to be doing. Um, and then, of course, I would I would be insane if I didn't say that our group continues to work on technical and legal strategies uh, to mitigate risk under the leadership of Brad, Brad Mallon, um, who is um, who is leading the data security process, co-leading the data security process for all of us. And we do a lot of work to try to figure out what the risks really are and what strategies really work um, to, um, to mitigate risks. So we have a lot of support for this. Um, 
Um, in addition to Brad and um, myself and Jay Clayton, who I've already mentioned, well, I've mentioned just about everybody. Um, uh, we also um, have been doing a lot of work looking at risk mitigation. And LawSeq, as I mentioned to you, is, the, is a project that we completed with Susan Wolf um, and others uh, uh, last year, in which we actually tried to outline what the law is and ought to be in terms of liability, quality, uh, privacy, and dealing with crossing domains, because there's a major issue in this area, which is that if you're in the research domain, very different rules apply than if you're in the clinical domain. And often the lines between those are really quite blurry. And this is our group, which goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, So with that, I hope I have laid out enough, um, enough fodder for you to think about, and I'd be happy to uh, take any questions or uh, engage in, uh, I'm gonna move that thing over here, that works better for me. And I'm happy to take questions. That was terrific, thank you. Um, I also wrote down movies to watch. So, um, and there was a, a, a lot of nice, um, comments going on in the chat box. Um, I have one here I'm gonna read to you that Carl um, just posted and um, then I'll read some others and give other people a chance to ask. One question is, what do you think about DTC being in serious research? Such as 23andMe confirming the results of GWAS studies by university researchers how significant might those contributions of DTC-based research become? Oh, that's a great question. It depends on what you think about the quality of the ancillary data that they have. I mean, I have no, I mean, I suspect that they know how to do sequencing or, you know, or uh, uh, genotyping. The question is how good are the data about the phenotype? And that, now I, I will be perfectly truthful. When we started the Emerge Consortium, uh, many years ago. And the question was, can you do research using stuff in the electronic medical record and genomics? And I have to say, I'm a general pediatrician, by the way. Um, and I sort of thought, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the EMR that's really not very good. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, we were able to do some research. So I think that the real issue with this is going to be, do, do they get good enough clinical data to do the research. I mean, I think they, you know, I think they can. I see no reason to think that they can't do the analytics. I mean, 23andMe has had big lead geneticists involved on their advisory board from their inception. I mean, um, and they went into business to do research. They went into find the Parkinson's gene. Um, so, um, so, I think, so I think they can. The question is just how good are the data? I mean, how good are the, you know, the clinical data that you're gonna be using. Thank you. Um, does anybody here wanna ask a question by unmuting themselves? Go ahead now. So someone, Cecilia is asking a question and I'm gonna answer this because we actually talked about it um, just a little this morning. Um, and this is something that Carl is working on. So I'm gonna steal his thunder to, to say what he said. But so the question is, you, can you, that you can ask for some genes not to be, uh, uh, some genes not to be revealed? Well, the apocryphal story about this is that James Watson, um, who you may have heard of in the Watson and Crick, uh, uh, actually didn't want his APOE uh, phenotype, genotype revealed. And it turned out that because of linkage, linkage disequilibrium, that it was pretty e easy to infer what his uh, APOE uh, uh, genotype was. And the other thing to do is, uh, so, so the thing that you would have to trust 23andMe to do is, uh, is to use some kind of, first of all, not to share uh, that genotype. I mean, they don't have to share it with you, but they could share it with somebody else. They could do that. Um, unless, unless they explicitly say no. But there have to be some kind of mechanisms in place 
that prevent a, a data use agreement, something that prevents them from inferring the genotype that you don't want shared. So Cecilia, did that answer your question? I think you'd have to unmute yourself, Cecilia. Sorry, hello. Sorry, I'm having yes. with issues. Um, yes. No, I guess I, that partially answered that I'm thinking a little bit more in lines of, you know, there's certain things we don't understand about the genome. So with that in mind, um, like let's say down the road, there's a gene that codes for a certain disease and you share your genetic information, but at the time you didn't know that we didn't understand that gene um, in particular. Uh, so, boy, that's a great question. Um, so this is, I would say, if you had to pick one of the most hot button issues in genetics right now, that's it. Um, because, and, and, it, and I'm going to try to put it this way. You do a genome now, and certainly Francis Collins in his book, The Language of Life, said, well, he sees no reason not to do, you know, your genome when you're a baby, and then you just refer to it over and over again. Um, uh, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Um, one is, if I had had my genome done five years ago, and I needed something now, what's the chance that I would not get my genome done again? Zero. Because a genome done now is definitely better quality than a genome done five years. Or, I mean, or I'm not even going to tell you how old I am, but to say that a genome that old would not be useful. I'm just saying. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's, you know, so that I think is, um, you know, that I think is part of it. The big issue is this issue about reinterpretation. Um, and I, I've actually published an article that came out in genetics and medicine. Was it in GIM? Yeah, genetics and medicine just in the last month or two. So you can look it up. There are a lot of people in genomics who are just rushing to reanalyze genomes all the time and return results. Um, I think that that is beyond insane. I mean, um, because it leads you into liability, into perpetuity. You know, if it becomes common practice to reinterpret your gen the genome, then you have to reinterpret the genome. And if you reinterpret the genome, then the whole purpose of that is to tell somebody. And we all know how hard it is to find, how pe find out how people are. I mean, find out where they are so that you can get, I mean, we found this in eMERGE. We had a big delay getting our results in eMERGE 3 and there were people we couldn't find and they were our patients and we couldn't find them. And so, you know, so this idea about, so if, at least if it's going to be in a, um, in a repository, you know, or in an institute, or, you know, a university database or something like that, I think the universities have to figure out if they really want primary responsibility for that, or if what I think would be um, a better thing would be perhaps for the individual to have access to their genome or know where it is, and then go to their go to their doctor when they think there's something that warrants, you know, a new examination. But I have to tell you, this is such a difficult issue, and so, I mean, Mark Rothstein wrote an article about it. Mm, uh, maybe seven or eight years ago. Uh, so, um, so people who are leaving, thank you. Um, uh, uh, you know, I think figuring out what we're going to do about this because we have never done this in medicine before, never. And if we're going to do this, we have to walk. We need to do it with our eyes wide open about what it's really going to mean and how hard it's really going to be. Um, but that. So yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. I hope you can see there's another um, very interesting question that just got posted. What do you think about a country that intends to map the genome of an entire population, justifying that the purpose is combating disease and knowing better their population's past? And what if the DNA is collected on birth? What would you think about the privacy then? And what do you think the population would think? Well, I mean, actually, there are several countries that are doing that. I mean, Iceland did it a while ago on decode. 
Um, Estonia is doing that under the Estonian Genome Project. Um, I think that, uh, you know, frankly, you know, here we are in the United States and, um, you know, we're deeply, many people are deeply, deeply skeptical of the government. So the likelihood that we could actually do that in this country, I think is actually really quite, um, uh, is really quite small. Um, I think other countries could have a different response to this based on their own view about what, you know, about what uh, their relationship with the government. So I just don't see that it would, I don't see that it would happen here. I do think that if we were to do, you know, a whole, you know, get D DNA on everybody, uh, maybe Congress and the legislatures would care about protecting privacy um, and so would be uh, more serious about it. I mean, they've been very serious about CODIS. Um, and so what I think is interesting for us is that we're actually willing to cede that, CEDE, um, to, you know, uh, to Ancestry and 23andMe. Um, and so uh, whether that is, you know, whether that is well warranted, I you know, I leave for others to decide. Well, um, a few other, if we have a minute here. Um, when you were doing some of your earlier focus groups and you found that discrimination was um, a big concern, have you found any patterns about um, what types of people are more or less willing to share their genome? And um, also do, uh, do people even read the privacy policies? Of course, well, let's answer the last one first. Of course they don't. I mean, have you ever read a privacy policy? I mean, have I re ever read a privacy policy? I mean, there was some article that yeah, yeah, Carl has. Um, I, I remember Brad has told me on several occasions about a, a paper that came out a number of years ago that said that it would take, if you, to read all the EULAs that you, click through in a year would take more than a year's time. I mean, it just, you know, it's not possible, which is the reason why I think there's only so much weight we can give to informed consent. I mean, we have to figure out better things about governance and better things about protection because informed consent cannot bear the weight, cannot bear the weight. Um, so, or, or bear all of it. Um, you know, I mean, the usual things, I mean, People who feel secure in their lives are more likely to share, you know, to share data than not. Although there's sort of a bell-shaped curve in this sense, it's actually not bell-shaped, but it's a little skewed. Um, uh, people, some people, are like like me, are um, pretty well educated, and, um, and but I feel pretty secure in my position, you know, and so. Um, I am happy to participate in research so long as they won't return any results to me. I don't want them surprising me. But other than that, I'm happy to do it. Um, so mostly well-educated, um, you know, secure people are more willing to do this in general than people who are less well-educated, less secure. Um, and interestingly, Older people are frequently more willing to do it because they want to help their kids. Um, you know, that's interesting. I mean, I mean, that's been true. That's been true in my research for the last 30 years. I mean, so um, and so, you know, right now we're doing all this work, you know, to try to get, I mean, one of the things that's a tragedy about genomics now is that most of the DNA that we use for GWAS and other things come from people of Northern European ancestry. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the people who are not of that ancestry or, or there's a big chunk now of Asian, um, but the people who are not of those ancestries, we have to get their trust and we've lost their trust. And so this is an area where Henrietta Locks had a huge impact. Um, and so I think and so Consuela Wilkins, who um, is one is um, in, uh, well, she's up here somewhere in my things you can't see anymore. Um, she did 75 focus groups. Um, uh, yes, there are a lot of problems with participation from African countries in no small part because it's like 
American hegemony with H H3 Africa. And what they want to do is be in charge. There was an article about that just in the last week or two in uh, Nature, I want to say. I can't remember. Nature or Science. Those are what I read. But, um, but the, you know, she did 75 focus groups um, with underrepresented minorities to get ready for all of us. And, and the fact is, they've done pretty well. The majority of people whom they've recruited are, in fact, underrepresented minorities. Now, how many of them stick with it for the whole project? I mean, you know, who knows? But I mean, this is this is viewed. Uh, I mean, this is viewed as I, I will tell you that Francis views this as a moral obligation, a moral obligation. Um, but it's going to it's going to be a heavy lift. No question. That's a, a lot of privacy issues, too. Um, very interesting. So that that that's good news toward personalized medicine. But there's a, another question on the flip side from Kristen Alts. I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, Kristen. I saw um, her though. She uh, came uh, right. Oh, one. on the flip side, how much of the population has to voluntarily share before it becomes a moot point for the rest of us in terms of protecting privacy? And she says she's from Northern European descent here. So it's the other side of the coin. Uh, you've lost it. I mean, that's <laughs> 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 and now, so Kristen, let me, uh, that was, uh, I'm being a jerk, sorry. There was an article two or three weeks ago in, <laughs> in science um, in which they, um, and, and, and a celebration of, you know, 20 years of the human genome, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they have an article by Jan of Ehrlich um, and others um, where he basically says, that you know that basically if you're of northern northern european ancestry you're done now i think he's actually hyperbolic in that one but i he did and he didn't cite any data so that's a problem but in his earlier work he has cited the data that somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of all people of northern european ancestry in this country can be um can be identified um using those data But look in science. It's just a short thing, so you'll enjoy reading it, but it'll make you cry. Wow. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Good flip side of the coin there. Um, are there any other questions here? We've got a lot of comments here saying thank you. Great talk. Um, uh, maybe being adopted is a privacy dividend now. Um, and deep, another uh, one from Crystal uh, Robin has was, a question. Yeah. No, that, that, no, but that was me. The privacy dividend of being adopted um, was me. I have to say, you know, there's a piece of this too, Ellen, as a family law scholar and a kind of, you know, touching on bioethics as I do. You know, I often think about my parents, you know, when my parents adopted my sister and myself, it was kind of like a black box you couldn't see inside. In fact, that was designed by the law that way. Right. So the, the adoptive family was fungible and interchangeable right. with the, with the, um, with the quote natural family, um, but, you know, I think it's I I always worried for my parents and their privacy. Um, these things because you know imagine a person just, you know, your parents raise you for decades and decades, and then this person just helicopters in and says, "Hey, I'm here. I'm your mom," and you're like, "Mom, what are you talking about? My mom is the person who's spent all of these years raising us." You know, it's a very very. Um, it, it has the potential to be so deeply hurtful um, oh, in, in so many ways too. Um, and so, Robin, there is so much evidence of that. I mean, mm -hmm. there's really a lot of evidence of that. And uh, uh, so it, in, it's interesting, Tennessee was one of the first states to go to open adoption. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, and I, you know, if, if you know that that's what you're doing at the front end, then fine, but there's, a, on the other hand, um, yeah. the, the sort of latest, you know, big crazy story is that there is a guy in the Netherlands who's, uh, who's donated sperm that have resulted in the birth of 300 kids. That's not a good yeah, one. Like that George Mason student. <laughs> yeah, the George Mason law student, the accidental incest problem that Naomi yeah. Khan talks about. So Yeah, I mean, it's just, I. I um, I think this is going to be just, and, and frankly, you know, think about, yeah. All I was going to say is that 
I think that looking at these external areas like family law, like TV and film, like what people are, is gonna be, I think if we just sort of limit ourselves to the same things that we've been doing, I don't think we're going to, I think we're not going to get enough sense about what it is that people are thinking about. People are not going to love having their lives disrupted. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, it really will push on the movement to open adoption because as you know, those agreements are not enforceable as I understand it in any state. So you kind of make an I bless you promise. Hey, yeah, I'm good with this. But then if you feel like not good about it later because you're worried about the fragility of your child or your relationship or anything. You don't have to do it. This is people being able to helicopter into your life unilaterally, as you said, like when your family member gives up their data, you know, they can just say, nope, I, I'm, I'm interested to, to, to be a part of your life. And um, there is no, no, no protective cover other than um, you just don't put your own data up and then you yeah. hope Nobody else around you does it either. Well, uh, the problem is, it's not just your data. It's all that. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> anyway, it's been a wonderful, I have to go um, to my own meeting. So, um, but wonderful to meet you. That was a lovely lecture. And I'm sure everybody agrees. On yes. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's give a kind of Zoom type applause for our. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Clayton. Uh, it's been a, a good. Um, way for us to get started with the genomic security and privacy theme.